welcome back. Both in chapter 42 and then in the Curiously Invisible chapter 43, neither the subheading nor the chapter number appear in the first edition, Cervantes continues the process of resolving the narrative threads of the previous chapters. This mainly involves finalizing the fates of Zoraida Maria and the captive through the latter's unexpected encounter with his younger brother. Nevertheless, and quite literally in the case of Don Quixote, Cervantes also recapitulates the novel's principal themes and ties up the moral loose ends of all the previous love stories. When the captive finishes his story, Don Fernando offers a theoretical review, approving of its style and content. On the one hand, he voices the literary tastes of Baroque readers who preferred variety, in other words, lots of action combined with quasi-miraculous coincidences, although all depicted realistically. Everything is unusual and strange and full of events that amaze and astonish whomever hears them. On the other hand, Fernando recognizes textual complexity, whereby each rereading offers new meaning. Even if tomorrow we were to find ourselves listening to the same tale, we would be glad that it had started over again. Then, Don Antonio and others offer to help the captive, especially Don Fernando, who seems a radically changed man. Fernando, in particular, offered that if he wished to go with him, he would arrange for his brother, the Marquis, to be Zoraida's godfather at her baptism. By the way, what is Don Antonio doing here? The last time we saw someone named Antonio was at the end of chapter 11, when a pastor sang the ballad of Olaya. Don Quixote's aggressive editors deem this an error and transform Don Antonio into Don Cardenio, or Don Fernando. I'm not so sure. Night falls, and now we face a temporal problem, for night already fell during Don Quixote's speech on arms and letters. A coach with another group of travelers approaches the end. It's the party of an oidor, literally listener, a kind of state judge ranking just below the royal council. The judge's servant asks if there is room at the inn, and when the innkeeper's wife tells him no, he insists. Well, even if that's the case, you must produce one for the Lord Judge. Oddly, the innkeeper's wife was troubled and allows herself to be intimidated, saying that she and her husband will move out of their room in order to accommodate his grace. At this point, Cervantes presents us with a list of women lodged at the inn, which now includes a maid, apparently about 16 years old, who arrives with the judge, and whose beauty competes with that of Dorotea, Lustinda, and Zoraida. Note that the verb admirar, to admire, dominates this section, indicating a novelistic climax via the emotional catharsis caused by all the coincidences that now occur. The welcome Don Quixote gives to the judge connects his arrival with the captive's tale in three ways. First, he indicates the lack of space at the end using the word estrecho, which refers to the Strait of Gibraltar and the Pillars of Hercules that mark the frontier between Moorish and Christian worlds. Second, he recalls his speech in chapters 37 and 38, juxtaposing the military profession of the captive and the legal profession of the judge. Third, he brings up the biblical as well as Petrarchan notion of women as stars that guide their followers to the promised land. Your worship may surely enter and rest within this castle, which although confined, estrecho, and poorly accommodated, no confinement or discomfort in the world does not yield to arms and letters, and even more so if these arms and letters bring as their guide and champion beauteousness as do the letters of your worship in this beauteous damsel, to whom not only must castles open and reveal themselves, but cliffs must split in two and mountains divide and fall in order to give her shelter. Enter your worship, I say, into this paradise, for here you will find stars and suns to accompany the heaven that your worship brings. This maiden is the judge's daughter and along with the other women, she enters the room formerly occupied by Don Quixote, where they will spend the night. The men remain. In the meantime, the captive, believing that the judge is his brother, interrogates one of the servants. We learn that the judge's name is Juan Pérez de Viedma, 
that he is from a place in the mountains of Leon, and that he is on his way to Seville, and from there to America, where he has been appointed judge at the Royal High Court of Mexico. The servant also reports that the mother of the daughter is deceased and that the judge is rich, not by his profession, but by the dowry that his daughter had inherited. This curious detail about the dowry of his daughter makes the judge potentially greedy, echoing the ambivalent parents of characters like Marcela and Lucinda. The captive is anxious. Since he has ended up poor, he does not believe that he will be received by his brother. Is poverty the real source of his shame? Could there be others, such as, for example, sodomy, or being engaged to a Morris? The priest offers to mediate and tells the judge the whole story of the captive, whose name we now learn for the first time is Rui Pérez de Viedma. Here Cervantes insinuates something suspicious about the judge's character, playing with the two meanings of his title, to all of which the judge was so attentive that he had never before been such a good listener. Moreover, the story that the priest tells does require attention to its details. In many ways, there is something impossible about it. The priest himself says, had it not been told to me by a man as truthful as he, I would have taken it to be one of those tales told by old women by the fire in wintertime. The priest actually lies, saying that he himself was at La Goleta and that he met Captain Biedma when the two were slaves in Constantinople. He ends the story by recounting the moment the captive and Thoraida were at the mercy of French pirates near the Strait of Gibraltar. He claims not to know whether or not they arrived safely in Spain. The judge reacts with tears and confesses that the captain of the story is his older brother. Then he tells the story of his family. They have heard nothing regarding the fate of the older brother, but he and his father now live very well thanks to the generosity of the younger brother who became a rich merchant in America, in Peru. He concludes by praising Thoraida. O oh, beautiful and liberal Thoraida, how could anyone ever repay you the good that you did my brother? By the way, here is another of Cervantes' alleged errors because according to the captive's tale, the youngest brother had gone to Salamanca to study law, and the second brother had gone to America to be a merchant. I refuse to believe that Cervantes was so inattentive when writing his novel. What could he be saying through this confusion among the professions of soldier, judge, and merchant? Or to put it another way, what is the relation among the military, the law, and commerce?